Welcome to the Advance Your Art podcast, where we talk about the journey from artist to entrepreneur and everything in between. You've worked hard to hone your craft. Now take it to the next level with tips, techniques, strategies, and routines used by successful artists to grow their businesses and careers. Now, let's get started and have some fun with your host, Yuri Cataldo. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Advance Your Art with Yuri Cataldo. If you're interested in learning how to build a company, make money from your art, or transition to a new career, you've come to the right place. If you like this episode, please make sure to like and subscribe and share it with a friend. Today, I'm chatting, chatting with Hugh Byrne, PhD. He is a teacher, trainer, and author on mindfulness and compassion for spiritual and social transformation, and the lead teacher at the Insight Meditation Community of Greater Washington. Recently, he's, he's uh, came out with a new book called Habit Swap, Trade in Your Unhealthy Habits for Mindful Ones. Hugh, how are you? I'm doing great today. <clears throat> how are you doing? I'm, I'm doing well. I, uh, where are you calling from? I'm uh, based just out of Washington, outside of Washington, D.C. in Silver Spring, Maryland. Okay. So we're still... Kind of a little bit more locked down than most most people right now, but um, you know I, I get out for walks and you know you know not too restrictive, so doing well. Yeah, well that's good. That's good. How has in general how has the last couple of months been for you? Well, it's been it's kind of been interesting that uh, <clears throat> fortunately, like some of us, but not all of us. I can, I was able to shift pretty much everything I do, almost everything I do from out in the world to doing it, you know, in the way we are today, doing it through Zoom, mainly through Zoom. So I I have uh, weekly meditation classes and they used to be in person, but now they're on Zoom and I have probably two or three times as many people because people don't have to get in their car and drive, you know, five, 10 miles and can just kind of jump on. And, uh, you know, so people can also join from long distances. So I teach a Sunday morning class and we had somebody from South Africa, from Johannesburg there on, and we often have folks from Europe, not often from Australia because the time difference is too kind of crazy. But so yeah. it's actually been, it's actually been, you know, it's been a lot of fun. I'll just say one more thing about that is I've been wanting to shift more of my work to the online space because then, you know, I can produce something, a, a workshop or something, and then it keeps, you know, it's evergreen in a way. Mm-hmm. And this has kind of forced me to jumpstart that, kind of push it up to a new level, really. So it's, I, you know, I'm, I'm conscious very much of suffering that's out there because that's kind of the business I'm in. But for myself and my partner, um, you know, we're grateful for not being badly affected, you know, as some are in this uh, in these times. Yeah, well, that's 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 good. It's good that you're able to ad- adapt and, and keep things going that way. So for my audience who is less familiar with your work, how do you describe yourself and what you do? Well, my I describe myself as a meditation teacher, a trainer, um, some uh, you know a coach. I help people. I help people cultivate meditation and mindfulness in their lives with mm-hmm. the in their life with with. Um, a, a kind of sense that or, or the goal really of living more happily more joyfully really more freely and so it's kind of a helping to do that and if we can get in touch with the places where we're stuck mm-hmm. then we can begin to kind of untangle the ways we are often tangled and mindfulness i found is a really key to that just this awareness present moment awareness yeah, excellent. Um, so I do want to get into m- more of that, but before we do, um, what did you originally go to school for? I went to school in England and I studied law, uh, interestingly, um, you know, because it kind of, I wasn't crazily interested in it, but I, uh, I kind of, it seemed like, oh, this seems like an interesting career path. 
And I actually found I was good at it. I was mm -hmm. good at that kind of analytical thinking. And it wasn't so much I believed in it. I kind of saw more and more that law was kind of it was more important that was going on behind the scenes, like who really had the power in the society and the law kind of reflects that. But I, I was, as I say, I was pretty good at it. And I taught it for four years back. I was in my 20s then back in the UK. And then relationship, marriage, etc. I came to, and uh, uh, two kids, I came to the US and I made a shift. I actually went into, did my graduate work in political science and that's what I had my PhD in. Mm -hmm. I also got involved, this was you know, a few de decades ago in the kind of act work around Central America. Folks will probably, you know, some folks will remember that, some will know of it, but the time of people coming up, escaping the wars in that region. And I was very much involved in human rights work in that, at that time. And, um, you know, that were kind of linked up with what I was doing there with, uh, you know, studying for a PhD and writing a dissertation and all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. Oh, good. So what what was it then that made you shift a bit to get on your current path now, studying mindfulness and meditation? Yeah, it's a great question. I'm, I, really, I was in, in the midst of doing that kind of activist work. I just happened to read a book. You know, these things happen in serendipitous ways. And for me, it was reading a book. And the book, I remember well, it was called the Way of Zen by Alan Watts, who was a kind of well-known, you know, Buddhist Zen teacher back in the what back in sixties and seventies. Mm -hmm. And I I started reading that book and it really started resonating with me, even though there were terms I didn't understand, it felt a little bit confusing in some ways. It was like it was pointing to something. And I actually had a kind of experience of opening up of not just, you know, it wasn't just in my head, it was just kind of letting go. Mm -hmm. And it was very, very powerful and affected me for a number of months. I just felt a level of happiness that I hadn't done for a long time. And this was kind of, I see this in retrospect as a kind of opening of the door. Because then I went through the door and I, then I started kind of reading all these books about this and Eastern philosophy and mysticism and all of that. And I kind of got deeper and deeper into it until... You know, the first big next change was going on a meditation retreat, you know, longer meditation retreat for about nine or 10 days. And again, that kind of was another dropping down to another level of it. So it was, it was kind of just one of those fortune things, one of those, I suppose, luck things that I happened to hit, it happened to hit me at a certain time and kind of push me in a certain direction. And uh, I haven't really looked back from that. Mm -hmm. Oh, great. So as as part of your journey then, um, and part of what we're chatting about today is, is uh, books, and you've written two of them, what initially made you want to, to write your first book? You know what, I, <clears throat> I'd been practicing meditation and mindfulness for probably 20, 25 years, but I've st I noticed when I looked at my own kind of habits, my own behaviors, that I could get very stuck in certain things, certain habits, that weren't things that I really wanted to be doing. And I said, how come I've been meditating and practicing mindfulness for so long and I'm still caught up in these habits? And yeah. I realized that I came to realize that habits are really have, you know, they're very tenacious, they're very sticky, you know, even with, with some awareness, you can get caught up in them and you keep playing them out and playing them out. So mm -hmm. what it did to me, it said to me, okay, there's something I need to look at here. So I began to read more and more about the science of habit change. You might have heard of uh, Charles Duhigg's book, The Power of Habit, which yeah. is a really excellent book in terms of explaining habits and where they come from and what's going on in our brains. And the more I did, you know, more I read particularly the original research, you know, the research studies of what's going on in the brain and when habits form, the more I became, came to see that, you know, what, what we all get, you know, why habits are so sticky, why they're so hard to change. And, yeah. and the more I got into it, the more it, I said, oh, okay, this is, it's important. There isn't, there aren't a lot of books around on this theme of bringing mindfulness to habits. There's, there's books like Charles Duhigg's book and mm -hmm. 
James Clear's book, Atomic Habits, and great books out there, but not very much of, of, of mindfulness as a way to work with our habits, as a way to kind of move in a better direction. What is it that you have, I guess, learned from your your first book that then you translated to the, the second book and, and wanted to dig into deeper? Yeah, there was a, a, a couple of main main themes. Uh, one that one that what we can do, you know, the title of the book is that we can actually change from un unhealthy to better, you know, more healthy habits, bad habits to good hob habits. And the mindfulness is the key because mindfulness allows us to bring the habit and, you know, whatever's triggering us to get, you know, to keep doing that, to bring that into awareness. So what it does is it actually makes what has become unconscious and automatic, which a habit is, it's kind of going on below the surface, <clears throat> below the radar as it, well, as, as it were. And to bring that into consciousness, and if we can bring it, you know, if you look at it as a circle with a, a line down the middle, unconscious being below the line and conscious being above the line, you're kind of bringing it above the line, you're looking, you're making what's unconscious conscious, and then you can make choices. And one of the ways you can change habits is you can replace more healthy, you know, bad habits with good habits, or, you know, ones that don't work for you with ones that do. Just for an example, a lot of people are very hard on themselves, you know, maybe you are, maybe, you know, we can all be hard on you, Self-judgment, self-criticism, oh, there I go again, I'm always screwing up, oh, this and that, all those stories. Yeah. What we can do with mindfulness is we can notice those, that habit of judgment, of self-criticism. And each time we, we see that coming up, we can actually replace it. We can replace it with self-compassion. So mm -hmm. self-judgment with self-compassion. Self-compassion is just being kind to yourself. It's like, oh, yeah, this I'm. This is hard, you know. I'm, I I wish myself well, you know. So instead of beating ourselves up, we're actually being kind to ourselves. You know, it could be as I'm talking to you, I'm like putting my hand on my heart and on my on my belly, and just that sense yeah. of you know caring about oneself. Because a, a lot of the time we we are really hard on ourselves, and this is that's just one example of the way a way we can kind of I call it kind of changing the channel, you know. Mm -hmm change from one thing to another and you know develop more healthy ha habits in our lives because habits are always going to be part of our lives but but we can make you know we can re can replace more better ones with not so good ones yeah how do you approach the idea of so like what you said about you know um, self i guess inflicted wounds in, in that way and um you know especially now we're all undergoing a similar type of, of trauma and that we're all stuck inside. And, yeah. and uh, you, know, every, you know, everywhere you see a post, it is like, you know, that, um, that Isaac Newton did this and other great histories, you know, figures of history created these beautiful works of art and profound things uh, during their own times of, of plagues um, and quarantine. And, and that's a lot to compare yourself to when you're not really set up for that. So yeah. how do you... How do you marry the idea of mindfulness, but also motivation so that you, you know, you keep yourself doing something that's good for you, but also not beat yourself up when, you know, the human part comes out? Yeah, I think the more, the more kind and accepting we are of our experience and we're not always, you know, we're not in a struggle with it at all. Mm -hmm. Of like I've got to have this and I've got to get rid of this the more we actually open to and allow what's here to be here you know make space for it the more in fact that we the more kind of space opens up for us to to be more at peace with ourselves more at ease more balance and from that I think naturally the energies arise to kind of to, to do things. It's not that we kind yeah. of become passive and whatever, you know, <laughs> um, you know, kind of just lay back on the couch with a beer, you know, it actually, you know, it, it can be actually be really energizing of mm -hmm. when, when there is that sense, because we're not using energy up 
in a struggle with the way things are. We're not kind of fighting because that really does take 